I'm Ethan Evans. This is my guest, Stefan. Um, you obviously, oh, you have Don IT here in chat. I'm, I have a feeling that's Fantastic. sitting right behind you. He says, stoke for this. Stefan always brings it. So you have at least one cheerleader. I got a fan. I that's got a right. fan. Uh, fantastic. Well, here, we'll have some fun with that. We'll, we'll, so, um, Darren Doan is, uh, Stefan's friend and provided the, uh, broadcast station he's sitting at. So what we'll do here, since he's learning Twitch a little bit, um, is we'll, we'll designate him a channel VIP, which, um, I think the main effects are when he chats again, he'll have a badge that looks like a diamond that indicates he's a VIP. And if I were to put the chat in some restricted slow mode, he'd be able to avoid it and keep talking. But anyway, uh, what we're here to talk about today is product management, the art of product management, the complexity of product management. Um, something that, by the way, the most popular YouTube video I've ever done, which is uh, out of a hundred or so is yeah. how to become a TPM, a technical program manager, huh. but I have never All done right. one on how to become a product manager. So in fact, right. you, oh. you quite possibly could work together with this honey. Yeah. You are, you quite possibly are about to star in the most popular video we'll ever do, <laughs> or at least next. Fantastic. Line. <laughs> All right. Love it. So Stefan and I overlap for 15 years at Amazon, but because of our very differing roles, had relatively little contact. Um, I was Amazing off. How that happens sometimes. Yeah, big company. I was off building digital products, uh, Prime Video, Prime Gaming, etc., and he was running the detail page uh, and working with sellers, so our third-party marketplace. Um, I'll let him explain it uh, himself as he introduces himself, but. Essentially, the detail page is internal language for the main pages on Amazon. When you go to an item and it's whether it's a book or a TV or whatever, and you see sort of a picture of the item and the price and all the information about it, that is what we call the details of the item, the detail page. And obviously, that page is super important um, for how whether or not people buy and a tiny change in buyer behavior on that page can fall through to be, um, at this point, billions of dollars. And so- Lost or won. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes you can lose. Yeah. yeah, lost or won, that's right. That's right. So um, with that as preamble though, Stefan, you, you know your career much better than I do. Uh, would you yeah. like to introduce yourself? And I'm gonna vanish um, from your view for long enough. I can see I'm pretty dark. I'm gonna turn up the light just a little. Have at it. Super. Well, Ethan, thanks for uh, thanks for having me. It's fun, you know. We we did overlap, and and we actually one of the wonderful things about Amazon, we overlapped in another way where we actually had people who worked on both of our teams, uh, so we could actually we bring out another person and be like, well, this is what it's like to work for Ethan or work for Stefan. It's kind of fun. Uh, when I started Amazon way back in the day, like you, I don't remember as much specialization. So I started in uh, supply chain operations and automated buying, and I just kind of remember there were product managers, or sorry, there weren't product managers, there were software engineers and everybody else, kind of not software engineer. So I started off, you know, we were mostly media, it was back in 2003. Uh, worked a lot on uh, some early things, very heavily in operations in Jeff Wilkie's world around uh, how do we help make better promises at Christmas to make sure we deliver on everything. You want to avoid these things. I got to work on this thing called cold pricklies. Uh, that feeling you get when you get the email <laughs> the day before Christmas is, sorry, that thing Amazon promised you, good luck at the mall. Uh, let's have less of those. Yeah. Um, so cold pricklies, it took me, I was slow on the uptake. It took me a while when I was working there to realize that's the opposite of warm fuzzies. Like you want to give people warm fuzzies, like, oh, you're going to get your Christmas present. You're going to, yes. you know, so the, the opposite yes. of warm fuzzies is cold pricklies and yes, yeah, not av avoiding, not, not fun. And there'll be some of those sent, I'm sure here in coming weeks very soon. Oh yeah. We're coming up. Ship, ship. You know, ship dates, I was very familiar with ship dates and Thanksgiving was spent on a telecall and uh, you learned a lot, but man, it was fun to dig into what were all the root causes, you know, and how did we, you know, why were things not being delivered or last minute shipments from vendors and how good were we at turning pallets to get those back out to customers? And, you know, we invented a lot of things out of the data analysis we did uh, for cold pricklies in order to make better promises or change policies. 
the uh, one of them being the andon cord, the one of the first like Jeff's like Jeff wants an andon cord customer service. Okay, um, we use some of the same technology that we had built for for cold pricklies, and to reduce those to actually implement the andon cord with customer service and. That sounds fun. But uh, after doing that for about five years, I had uh, the opportunity uh, to go work in Marketplace 2009 mm -hmm. and uh, felt like I was running to a fire a little bit. Uh, you know, I heard of people leaving Marketplace or some software challenges. Uh, but the the core business of third party selling on Amazon and some of the new leaders with Sebastian and Peter and some of those that were coming into place there, it's like, seems like a great opportunity. And Related to this, I had been a senior software manager, right? But as a software manager, you still own your functions. So you're responsible for business metrics. Are we in stock? Did we get the orders placed? Uh, but it's like, well, do you want to be a product manager? And I'm like, what does a product manager do? Uh, you know, am I qualified to be a product manager? Uh, and so I'd, I'd gotten asked around, talked to some different people. Uh, and it was, well, you need to figure out how our tools, how our B2B portal for sellers should work and what features should it have and how are you going to deliver it? And most importantly, you know, it goes back to the working backwards questions. Really, the definition of product manager at that point was, can you articulate what are you building for whom with what impact and why now? Right. And it's like, OK, that at the core of it. So from 2009, 2016. Uh, we rolled out a number of tools for our third-party sellers that we built from scratch. Um, again, 2009, if you wanted to return to a seller, uh, it was an email. You know, Amazon, you went and filled out a form on the site. You know, it said, hey, I want to return this thing. If you had bought it from a seller, it was like, hey, good luck. Email the seller. Uh, so there's a lot of catch-up work. Uh, but then it was also, what tools do we need to bring to help sellers compete and deliver a more uh, a superior experience? So what products? So we built some stuff called Selling Coach. We built an Amazon seller mobile app. Uh, we built some automated pricing tools. Uh, since uh, sellers drove the used business, uh, we took over the used business responsibilities uh, in Marketplace. And I got to lead a team. We invented a, a product offering for certified refurbished and uh, brought that out to, to create a great experience there. And then 2016, after a good run, in seller space, I came over to the detail page. And at the time, it was a great place to look at how do we day one the detail page? What do we still need to invent? Uh, when we look across the team and the engineers and the product managers, uh, and like many things at Amazon, the detail page is like, wow, we never have enough people. Uh, this team has three times the amount of people we do. Uh, we need more people. It's like salespeople and leads. We need better leads. It's like, hey, we got the people we got. Let's go earn it. So I got to, uh, we focused on making the detail page a little more personalized to a shopping experience by product type and by customer and by connection. So how do we, you know, there is no typical customer on Amazon. When you have hundreds of millions of customers, how do you flex so that the page feels very tailored or the experience, shopping experience feels tailored uh, to each kind of customer that's coming? Yep. And that was our, our product strategy. Uh, and how do we increase the number of experiments? So how do we look underneath at the, the software um, architecture to reduce the cost and time of experiments? So I did that for about three years until uh, last August. And now I've been doing my own thing and working with startups and working with other e-commerce marketplaces and trying to help uh, help people in their careers. So. Yeah. So uh, I met Stefani reached out to me about um, discussing just how he was going about building his new business. And I would say the most exciting thing I learned as you can imagine, if you take someone who knows how Amazon has gotten to the high performance level it is in e-commerce and let them work on your um, newer e-commerce site that may not have had all the same optimization, he can drive huge um, gains in that uh, in other other people's websites pretty quickly um, based on essentially looking at what Amazon did, uh, analyzing the same data uh, for others. I'm shortcutting what you explained to me and then having yeah. them do the low hanging fruit from that because Amazon's been optimizing its detail page for over for a long time. 20 years. 20 years. Yeah. yeah. And so at this point, you know, we're thrilled if we get a 0.01% positive change that's real because that's still millions yeah. of dollars. But for a lot of other uh, 
e-commerce websites, it's still possible to move the needle by whole percentage points or more. Yeah, Amazon has to play out in the innovation space. Like what is, they're still day one. Like what is shopping for home furniture on? Like there's lots to invent or apparel. There's lots Clothing, to invent. Yeah. But Amazon's out in the innovation space or consumables, right? There's there's lots of places where uh, there's still a lot to invent, uh, um, have a great innovation. But well, you're like, doing it at scale or you're out in the edges. And there's so much just basics, grounding basics. You what know, should I love the button to come say? To What's the checkout flow? How do you get steps out of it? Yeah. How do you get steps out of it? What do people pay attention to? Um, you know, what are they actually looking at on a page to make a decision? Uh, there's decades of research that we're able to, to pull together or we Amazon gets to test so much, right? At any given time, I had literally hundreds of experiments going on either validating beliefs that we'd learned already, but want to revalidate or something that new. So you can, you can bring those benchmarks to bear and go, I'm a little skeptical that it's going to work. Let's try this and uh, see if that'll get you some progress. Yeah. You can make some big jumps, but it was fun talking with you. You know, the, uh, we hired a lot of people in that time, right? You and sure. I both were bar raisers. We brought a lot of people on and you've made a comment that, you know, one of the hardest areas to hide, and that's what we're talking about product management was and the area you had, you had actually fired people the most or it's like, you know, it's not working out had been product management. I was hoping to hear you unpack that a little bit more. Uh, Cause yeah, it, you know, yeah, I was no, where you it, and I had differed. It, it, was, had a, it was a provocative yeah. statement. Um, yeah. So here's my actual experience. Uh, I have worked with many great product managers. I have also, I don't have data. I didn't track the data, but it is my feeling, my belief from hiring that on my team and on an adjacent team I was very familiar with that we did our best, we interviewed and we hired product managers only to then over time feel they weren't succeeding and work with them to go to other rule, um, other roles uh, or leave the company in greater percentage than any other role. Okay. And um, my instinct on that, well, my, my belief over time is it came down to two things it w or three things. It was people who wouldn't, couldn't or wouldn't get deep into the data. They wanted to work off their opinions mm -hmm. or instincts. Um, second, people who couldn't articulate their ideas. So they couldn't, maybe they had the data, maybe they didn't, but they couldn't explain why they were making a choice or recommending a choice. Uh, and then third, just people with poor judgment that the choices they kept recommending were poor. Um, this person wasn't a product manager, but I, I totally recall working. I've worked with two people in my career where what I learned before I worked with them to find new roles was that if this person is recommending a thing, a yeah, that, that the only thing I could be high confidence in is that not a was the next step it, it could be you know um sometimes it was just if they're saying turn it on i knew not to turn it on and that was binary sometimes it was just they said the button should be green and i knew it should be any color but green, not green. um but uh at least it was consistently wrong a lot it was yeah it was wrong so a lot as opposed to right a lot it was wrong. so the i got principles. better at this i guess but one of the things that I think made this job so hard, makes product management so hard, is at least at Amazon, we expect product managers to be miniature GMs. They're supposed to understand the product, be deep in the financials if, it, if the product can be tied at all the financials, including owning a P&L if it has one. Yeah. Um, they're usually the public face to executives. Uh, and then they need to be able to be technically astute enough to hold the respect and drive the engineering teams. And, you know, that's a huge remit. And so the pattern I saw was lots of people failed to be able to do one part of that. And then the rest of the people, as soon as they showed they could do all of that, they got promoted into more of a GM role. And so you had this sucking sound on both sides of the PM equation where one set of people were falling out the bottom because they couldn't do all those sort of different tasks from tech to finance to communication to customer insight and the other half were being like yep you can do them all so here's a team of 25 people in your own service and a bunch of goals 
and um, that was my experience. Yeah. Uh, and so I don't, I'd like to improve on that. And that's why actually I told you when we talked, I was super eager because you seem to have a better experience or at least less frustration. Uh, and so, you know, I'm totally open to the idea that I never got good at hiring product management, at, at figuring out either a set of people who could be in product management and not move on to general leadership and who'd yep. be stable or just a bigger pipeline and use it as a pipeline. Um, yeah. but if you have questions about my experience, I can certainly share more, but that, that was, <laughs> well, I think that context is, is, is fine. And, and there's a couple things I picked out of that right away. Uh, cause I resonate, you know, with, with what you're saying, you know, we were in a time marketplace from 2009 to 2015, 2016 grew from 25% of Amazon's business to 50 plus. Right. And so we in marketplace were a being rewarded with uh, a, a lot of people to hire. Uh, and B, you know, we were spinning up new products and programs quickly that uh, you had to quickly find leaders for. Uh, so, you know, I think uh, one thing I saw is is we were doing it in mass um, and uh, that was, became part of my response. I was like, oh, I need a leader for uh, Amazon seller pricing. Uh, oh, I need a leader for the Amazon, you know, for the offer listing page for OLP. Uh, who's going to drive that? I need a leader for seller central. Uh, and... Uh, I think one benefit for me is because I had gone through this quick phase of product management, uh, I had to learn something myself and create a framework for myself. What's working, what's not working. Uh, great way to learn some is try to do it, right? That's why we're on Twitch. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna try to do it, right? <laughs> uh, but then putting a framework, you know, uh, we, I tend to be a fan of classical education where you go through these stages versus a grammar phase. Like everything has a grammar. You know, what is the order organization? So uh, two things worked in my favor that ended up helping me, I think. Uh, one is I had a framework that worked for me to be able to say across my product management team, uh, I need to have my product managers for their level, junior, senior. I want to see, uh, I had a framework that worked, right? That I could start to assess them. What's their ability for strategy? What's their ability for analytics? What's their ability for execution? And they have to be great at one of those uh, and, and competent for their level in, a, in the other two. And they have to know how to compensate. Because uh, you mentioned, like, yeah, you got to be able to read a PL, define an API, and oh, by the way, uh, please do a regression analysis or, or you know, build something in R. Um, and that kind of person is you know, a challenge. So on so, top sorry, of whatever list, domain list those had, three again, analytics. Yeah. So I, I looked to kind of score my product managers and then look across my team for strategy, right? If I get someone from Harvard, you know, business school, uh, great. They probably have done a lot of cases and casework, you know, and, and may sit down and go, should we be going to market as a Salesforce plugin app or should we be, you know, which country should we expand to next, right? They've probably got some great skills and strategy, but schools renowned for that. Yeah. But if I wanted someone kind of deep, maybe to lead the Amazon seller pricing program or the Amazon fees, uh, seller fees, I may look for someone who's a superstar in analytics, right? Maybe they came out of Wharton or out of Chicago, which are MBA programs that have, you know, deep quantitative uh, 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 reputations, right? We have, then, we have a Chicago then, fan in chat who's... <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> well, I spent my time in Chicago, go bears, go Cubs. Um, but so strategy analytics and execution, and then everybody had to have some domain backgrounds, uh, whether they were tech, whatever. So when I was hiring or when I was filtering, you know, I was scoring on those, you know, and there's certainly sub pieces of that. Um, uh, but that framework for me was pretty critical. Because then I'd also look across my team and go, you know, if I've got a great quant guy and I've got four, say four or five product managers on my team, this is really more like a pitching rotation in baseball. Everybody's throwing individually for their program, but can they work together as kind of craftsmen, right? Can they lean on each other? Can they help my overall team say, hey, you know, as a group, we're going to make an OP1 anyway. So I want you to own this part of it. You own this. Uh, I owned platform teams. And so what I typically found is the MBA, traditional MBA pipeline at Amazon didn't work very well for me uh, for a number of my product managers. 
uh, because, you know, when you own the detail page, <laughs> there's a lot of engineers and teams that want things from you. Uh, you're almost like an internal AWS to some degree. I always wanted to benchmark, you know, how many people check in code and use my APIs? You know, where would I stand on the AWS stack rank? Um, so I ended up For those who don't really understand, good... right, the way Amazon's organized. Yeah, so yeah. Stefan owned the detail page, but every group that has, that sells something once changes to that page that favor what they need. And I was one of those many groups. Sure. Uh, when I ran, yeah. for example, Prime Video, because we wanted we wanted detail pages that made it obvious how TV and movies were rented and so on, which was not Amazon's normal use case, right? Amazon's normal use case was buy the book, it goes in a box, it comes to your door. Buy the shoes, they go in a box, they come to your door. door. We were doing digital things that don't go in a box and don't come to a door. And I... Uh, since this is a gaming you audience, changes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, since this is a gaming audience, I'll, I'll share that uh, there was once long ago an Amazon SVP that I was talking to about uh, a Vorpal sword in a game, and he asked me how would that ship if you bought a sword in a game? How would it ship? <laughs> and um, that was one of those little like, okay, pause, rethink, like. How do I explain this to someone who has no idea, you know, about a virtual item? So <laughs> it's the last game you played. Yeah. Yeah. I forgot, we got to make sure I, I translate. So, you know, that's a challenge. Uh, you know, even the seller central B2B portal, there's lots of teams that wanted to build a business function to expose to seller. So that execution bucket is the one that I often felt got underrated mm. uh, on product manager and product manager teams. And I had some great success uh, when I looked at, you know, would look at LinkedIn and look at resumes. I would look for somebody. So military, right? You, you, how do you coordinate and communicate across two or three or four regions, right? Which Amazon is in, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, criticisms at platform teams at Amazon is often like, Hey, the platform made a change and I didn't know what happened. I didn't know. I didn't know the new capability was available. Uh, and that would work out two ways. One, I'd get a product manager who'd often be able to you know, coordinate across the multiple dependencies of delivering a new piece of software or just all the internal and external users of a thing. They just thought differently about how to communicate, how to make sure there's clear line of sight. Uh, so I found that when I made sure I tested for execution or if I had at least one product manager on my team who could model great practices at execution and set best practices for my team for the rest of the group to copy. So that was the second benefit of looking across this framework by picking up product managers who were superstars in one of the three, they would end up modeling to each other best practices, and they made each all better. They made all of each other better, right? So uh, that strategy analytics execution framework worked out a couple of ways, and it would also change where and how I looked uh, for product managers to source. Uh, I've had some great backgrounds, uh, people that are probably non-traditional. Uh, in, you know, they didn't necessarily come through an MBA pipeline, but they knew how to get their own data. Uh, they knew how to uh, make frameworks and prioritization uh, and test cases with that data and then uh, be able to put it together in a way that communicated to a, a tech team what the value or the value proposition was for each release in the roadmap and communicate it out, right? They could answer those questions. What are we building for whom uh, with what impact at a level of specificity and detail that works really well at Amazon. So that was, that was my framework somewhat, you know, you know, and you kind of double click, it worked a couple ways. One, it worked for filtering. How did I find people? You know, I could look for evidence, uh, you know, did this person succeed in a startup type environment? Uh, did they succeed in a larger multi stakeholder environment, right? That gave me a sense of execution. Uh, analytics, you know, how did they make trade-offs, make prioritizations? What frameworks did they put in place? Were they able to get their own data? Uh, had they learned something previously, uh, how to get data, what to do with it, and then how to communicate with it. Uh, and then, you know, strategy, again, you know, is getting into customers again, position or, or getting into understanding technology. You know, I tend to think um, a great product manager is thinking of your, your question about that. And like, well, I think it's someone who is a really great noise to signal capabilities. 
in multiple environments. They can do noise to signal in tech. They can do noise to signal with competitors. They can do noise to signal with understanding customer signals and turning them into uh, a, 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 a signal around a, a, something useful that has a good understanding that other people can grab onto. Uh, and, you know, those I was thinking because I'm I'm not a great product manager, but I've had the chance to work with some. And uh, you know, people have launched some some really great stuff, and uh, who made some hard choices uh, along the way. Well, so much I talk a lot here in all fields, but particularly in leadership. A lot of what you're talking about is judgment, right? It's the be right a lot yes. of Amazon. It's the how, you know, there's, to your point about noise to signal, whether it's technical and there are many technical options, how do you pick the best one or many product features you can work on next and how do you pick the best one and know what minimum looks like. That, that ability to filter out all the opinions and come down with the one or two key choices. Um, is huge and so when i think about what really has mattered for product managers on your list it's been analytics and strategy feed into those choices and execution comes out of them so execution is what translates those back into um a result and so it's the pipeline of how do i make the right decision how do i get it built um, and for those of you who entered some questions and didn't see them pop up, we have a, a list of questions that people can vote on as the show goes by, Stefan. Fantastic. Um, and so right now what, what happens is anybody can input a question and then everybody can vote for what we'll talk about later. So it allows the show to be kind of audience directed to what they want to know the most. Um, but so that's mentioned right a lot. Yeah. You know, and, and I agree with you. But that's also one of the internally, I think even with Amazon, that's, you know, you do a hiring bar raiser class, right? It's like how to hire. And it's like, well, which leadership? I got assigned right a lot. What are your questions for that? Right. And understanding right a lot doesn't mean you're just a good guesser. You know, my answer to that, and I don't know what yours was, was usually you've developed a lot of mental models that allow you to recognize patterns and frameworks that allow you to evaluate them. You have a lot of plays in your playbook uh, that give you, you may have intuition because you spent a lot of time in the space. Uh, you may have knowledge that help you to be right a lot, but you know, investing in understanding uh, what are common patterns or plays that you can do, uh, that, that those, those are things that help you be right a lot. It's not a, I was born with a lucky right a lot gene. Maybe there's some people like that, uh, but right a lot is, is also, what I would say is, is product management, I wanted to pursue is product management a craft and as a craft, are there some structures and frameworks that I can help my product managers be better at, right? And are there methods of work that I can help them or work with them that we can start to set standards? And that was what I pursued. It was really trying to say, how do we set up product management as a craft? Mm. Uh, it's, it's easier to might maybe say, okay, I can test some engineers. We can talk about, we know what the craft is there, the data structure, scale and extensibility. But uh, I really pushed my team. So once we were even hired, we would push each other to go, how do we, how do we make this a repeatable craft and, and apprentice the newest product managers to, to make sure they, uh, they are getting better. And every time we do a new kind of analysis, it's repeatable. And we know how to have our whole team do it. Uh, so the framework helped me find it and helped us manage. But then we would push that down another level. Because um, we, I, I made some mistakes once, and that's a different part we'll come up to. But. Yeah, I'm glad you only made them once. You're very astute <laughs> to learn that quickly. <laughs> so there These are a lot of people make once. with um, questions. I think I was going to yeah. go on to some other stuff of how to find product managers and so on, but there's one here in chat I want to jump on, and then we'll go to the list. I'll it's a question yeah. I've wrestled with a lot, which is data-driven improvements can lead you to incrementalism. Tweak, 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 tweak. Um, and the person here has put forward the theory that Amazon's detail page, which has been optimized for 20 years, is highly effective, but might not be as effective as a complete somehow magical redesign 
that could have the advantage of a clean start. How do you, how do you, I guess, what do you think about that? And um, I can talk a little bit about my experience with efforts to have a clean start. Uh, you know, spoiler, they actually haven't worked out very well. Incrementalism has been better, but I'm curious, uh, since you have more expertise here, what you think. Like if you were offered the chance to scrap the detailed page, take all the learning, but go clean from the beginning and have something say more elegant, would you do that? Or would you be like, no, that's a terrible idea? Uh, I would lean toward that's a terrible idea. Okay. Uh, but but I'll come back to because uh, geez, not like I haven't had this conversation before. I'm um, well, that's a good uh, point. And so it's fun to have it. Uh, we can have it with another audience because it, it wouldn't be the first time uh, that, that we say that. You know, you're with the Amazon detail page, and that's why I started from. I do think that when I first came into the team, they had been wrestling with some challenges, and they hadn't had as much freedom to be able to say, "Hey, let's take a step back and go." It's you know, how would do we day one some of these things, right? It's like, hey, let's keep going with the incrementalism. I thought your question was the uh, the the person's question was going to go a different way, so I'm going to take it. Take two go ways. go both, yeah, yeah, yeah. So first on the detail, let me go back the other way. Uh, sometimes with product managers, what I see is like, hey, they have the data they have, and they identify a a big enough improvement to their business that satisfies their stakeholders. Uh, and so they really do have an evolutionary product roadmap. But, you know, we were challenged in marketplace. No, no, think big, think big, think big. And so, you know, product data focused or data driven product management uh, doesn't have to force you into an evolutionary. Sometimes you want to flip the question around in the craft and go, well, if we were thinking big, what would we have to believe? Mm. Right. What would we have to know? to say how many customers are behind the cloud, right? We can't see, uh, there's a cloud between us and what we can see. We see a couple customers, but how do we know that if we chase those customers, there's another thousand with a lot of value behind the cloud we can't see. Yeah, what what right? would need and to so, be true? What? Yeah, what a, would need to be true? a great true. question. Super yeah. powerful question to unlock innovation. Um, setting things up as hypotheses, right? I got to work for some, fantastic ex McKinsey people who really gave me some great training and butt kicking on, you know, your point of like, it's hard to art for some product managers to articulate. I got some great, I'm an intuitive a lot of times. And so I was really pushed to go back and say, set it up as hypotheses, set it up as conditions. We want to play along with you, but you have to give us a way to measure with you. Right. Uh, and so, well, the hypothesis is if this is true, this would happen. So those are another ways. Analytics isn't just like sit down, do a bunch of number crunching. It's really being able to quantify and and create some sizing around. You get to create your own ruler. How will we be held accountable? And here's the, the piece. So back to the detail page, because uh, your analytics are also somewhat subject to your strategy. Our strategy for the most part of detail page had been um, – there's a lot of evolutions to do, and we had a lot of innovation. Uh, but uh, what we, to take a step back um, to your earlier point, because of the traffic on the detail page, we wanted to respect the website, but not fear it, right? And we had to break some mindsets of, can't make that change because that could cause a lot of risk. What we also had to think about was how do we test our way? Uh, what would we have to learn along the way to uh, expand our risk pool, right? When you make these big bang changes, clean slate, you're, if you, I'm willing to blow up a good business to make a great one, sure. but I need some proof points, right? Yeah. How do I know that's gonna be a great business? So to your, your point of like, well, someone's opinion, uh, my opinion, your opinion, some people have better opinions than others. Um, so we did this in clothing or with brand. Right. We took a step back and said, you know what, Apple, Apple could be an even better shopping experience on Amazon than in the Apple store. Uh, I have my app, Amazon app on your phone. I'm actually on your Apple device. Uh, I can video on your Apple device. I should be able to get customer service right away. I know how long you've, I should have access to both your Apple account and your Amazon account. I know how long you've been an Amazon customer. I know how long you've been an Apple customer. 
Um, like there could be opportunities here. What if we were to make a really brand focus, right? And that was a way of kind of culling down risk, saying we're not going to throw everything in the detail page out. Let's find a place that uh, the strategy of a new shopping experience would be great for customers and truly innovative. Um, clothing, we had started to, you know, I mentioned we had a strategy of tailoring the product page. So the layout look feel uh, was a little more focused to the product and the customer because surprise, uh, Amazon had managed to prove what most people already intuitively know people shop. Uh, for things a little bit differently, whether it's visual or whether it's technical. Mm -hmm. So what would you want to do on a, a, what would be a great apparel shopping experience? Well, maybe bigger pictures, right? Maybe I want to have a little more video tweaking or since it's a video game audience, why shouldn't the default photo be a video if you have a high enough bandwidth connection, right? Like, let's just show you the first 30 second clip of that game, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's the default experience. Now, how much of the page should take? Well, we still have to live within the constraints of the detail page. So, uh, you know, what we tried to also live with is um, there's a, the, and I'm probably not explaining this well to the whole theme of the question, but I wanted to also not just create a new experience, but also say, how do we let more people across the Amazon internal ecosystem contribute to those experiments? So I wanted to make it so that we had a platform capability that let people try more stuff. And it's harder to try complete new things uh, and then scale them later. So that's what we were balancing on my team a little bit is we made a strategic choice that in order to invent a new shopping experience for furniture or for clothing, we were going to make some big changes on components, but then focus on the infrastructure to increase the rate of experiments that people could do. And yeah, I would agree. I taunted my team a little bit. I'm like, when's the last cool thing that everybody remembers we invented? One click? Like, that's the last thing people remember we invented on Amazon Detail Page. Like, yeah. let's go, let's go beat that, right? Well, it's definitely <laughs> go invent immersive video for video games or something. Yeah. This is this is a super hard question, but just to share because I said my experiences were bad. Um, every couple of years when I led Amazon video and, and some other teams, there'd be a movement to say, well, the thing that's going to really make prime video take off is a better UI and we need to overhaul the play experience and so on. And those efforts always took a lot of work and they sometimes made some improvements, but they were never needle movers. Um, and in that case, it's a long story, but in that case, it's because the initial product offer was poor. Um, basically in that time, uh, buying or renting a movie on Amazon was worse than buying the DVD or renting it from Netflix back in the old DVD mail business. And so the fundamental problem that was, yeah. Yeah, the, the fundamental problem was lousy product, like lousy product offering and no amount of better UI was going to make lousy product better, which, um, interestingly, you know, the detail page gets better and better because we improve the things that feed it like the fact you talked about cold pricklies, the fact that, you know, when I began at Amazon, we did not have the delivery promise on it. We didn't have the thing that probably yeah. now everyone's familiar with that says, oh, click now, you know, click within the next two hours and seven minutes uh, to get this product. And we didn't have the thing that said only three left in stock, you know, yeah. none of those things existed. And so the detail page gets better and better in part because we feed it better and better things so there's two things that you mentioned there that, that i think may also help answer this question from folks one is um you uh there's a pattern i used in product both with uh, the amazon detail page as well the place we actually took a lot of stuff off right so one thing that happens over time especially in a multi-tenant environment is you win and you get to have your feature you get to have your product kind of live in that space and you never have to re-audition right um, and so I had found features on the detail page that were a decade old, uh, barely been used, and they were really cluttering the page, right? And so we would do this periodic uh, earn your keep, re-audition for the choir. Uh, we're going to re-web test. And man, that would get people all, you know, but I own this product. Yes, but do customers care, right? Uh, and the second pattern that I saw, so, you know, some of our biggest wins were actually taking features out of the buy box, taking features out. Uh, cleaning up the house. Yeah. Um, that was a good product thing that uh, you know, one of my product questions became, you know, when's the last time you killed a, a product feature? 
right? Or how do you maintain that ongoing operation? Because again, people thinking about strategy and analytics are often folks, I'm like, I'm going to launch the next new thing. Uh, it's like, well, great. How do you run your business? What's the last uh, thing you kill software, is a great right? question. For those who are interested uh, in how you... to interview product managers or for people who aspire yeah. to it, figuring out what to kill. Because products accumulate cruft. Um, oh. You know, they, they accumulate little used functions that are tremendously loved, beloved of 10 people who are also very vocal. And it's very hard to kill them. And even more if those features generate some amount of revenue, because like, well, if we take that out, we'll lose seven dollars, you know, and like seeing the hidden opportunity cost of getting rid of all the seven dollar features to have more cleanliness um, is tough. Yeah, we penalize. We, we regularly look for opportunities to apply. You get more of what you subsidize and less of what you penalize. Uh, and so did we have the right economics when we op, uh, you know, operate a platform? You know, so killing stuff and when's the last time you cleaned house and killed stuff, you know, took stuff off the page uh, was a key, uh, key piece. Understanding the second thing, what can happen, I saw on a multi-tenant platform like the detail page or like, you know, uh, Seller Central and the B2B portal where lots of people put their product uh, is that uh, there's there's some some lack of clarity. People tend to optimize their function, their little corner without recognizing that customers are looking at the whole thing, right? So we started to do some analysis of the, the detail page, looking at, hey, customers are looking at this thing as a whole page and they're looking at it like a, a, a movie poster, right? Or a rock concert poster. And if you're obsessing about that little chunk of, you know, size chart or comparison chart, um, if you're obsessing over this little review display, that's great, right? I want you obsessing and doing great, excellent work right? Customers eyeballs are scanning all over and they're scanning and pulling and people don't read. People absorb <laughs> information read. in a visual That's way. definitely true. Right? Uh, you know, I don't know how many design decisions we've made around, look, people don't read. Um, they're scanning bullet points, product points. Uh, it's interesting you, know, so you we, say that for all of my audience who's here and I'm always talking about resumes. This is an aside yeah. that it will make a point. <laughs> People always think they're going to get their resume read. And I keep trying to tell them, no one is reading your resume. They are scanning it. They are glancing over it. They're going back up and down. And if it's a dense wall of text, it's not about the life story you want to tell. It's about the few bullets you can get to jump out that, that will land with yeah. them. Um, because yeah. people don't read and you're like, no, no, they're going to read my read. resume. They're going to read all three pages or all six pages. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's, I, I wish happen. it was. They're going to scan for your last title. <laughs> um, and a few you other. Know, yeah. Yeah. Oh, we can, we can go on that. But one of the things I would poke on, you know, I mentioned my framework and as a craft, you know, my product management team, you know, we'd regularly, um, uh, do a couple things. One, I had a master class of books. Uh, mm -hmm. about six to 10 books. And I would tell my product managers, look, I expect you to have some familiarity with the concepts in these books because it will help our team's communication. Mm. Um, I read these, I've read these books and some of them are pretty Amazon standard, like the goal and understanding theory of constraints right. or uh, some of Tufty. I didn't use Tufty. I used a different information right. dashboard design by Stephen Few. It's like, look, you should understand some basics of color and space and aspect ratio. That's table stakes. Right. Uh, but then we, we try to drive curiosity. So we didn't necessarily go have a new book club. Uh, we would talk periodically about these books across my product team. Um, and we would say, hey, is there anything remember? Let's let's reread one of these. Is there any concept here that we'd want to pull out and try uh, and, and try storm in a sense? Um, it stuck out to you. Let's try it and, and test it. Right. Well, so the, we would the idea of a common language of our craft. Yeah, yeah. The idea of a common language makes a ton of sense to me, right? If a team yeah. can communicate faster because it can speak in a shorthand. And that's of course where design patterns yeah. came from in engineering is how can we how can we yeah. reduce the number of words <coughs> we need to say to get ideas across to each other? In the interviewing product managers, one of the things I'd watch out for as a yellow flag was anybody who got really excited about some methodology, 
Hmm. Right. And, and this already would get people's hackles, you know, Amazon, you know, interviewing, but, uh, you know, people tend to grasp, Hey, this worked. Um, and what I would poke on is like, I got less, uh, less worried about, um, which kind of analytics you were good at or whether you like data science and machine learning versus Bayesian statistics or regression or R. Because uh, I was more interested in whether you understood the first principles behind those. How do you structure a good? Uh, how do you structure a good analysis? What is an output of good analysis? Uh, do you know how to how to see what good work looks like? And do you have at least one tool in your in your toolbox that you can use? Uh, that was an interview test, an interview filter. Uh, but if someone wanted to talk to me about their PMP certification. I wouldn't necessarily throw them out, but I try to unpack and get like, well, what's really valuable about project management for you? When you work with people who don't know PMP, uh, how do you bring the common language back right. to, to deliver something with them? Okay. Right? So getting to those, uh, what are the underlying skills and first principles and can you transfer domain areas? You know, I had a guy who was successful in the army, successful at a consulting services business, uh, successful at a small tech startup, right? It's like three very different domain areas. How did he keep replicating his success? Uh, we were able to unpack, you know, how he, you know, observed and drove some orientation and then, then decided and drove to action. So nice. Drove a OODA loop. Yeah, it's fun. So let's, let's jump into a few of the top audience questions. Uh, the yeah. first one, I'll read them off here. Um, could you talk a bit about responsibility? Do you have any methods for coping with the amount of pressure a product manager must feel? So in this role, and you certainly were in this role, you talked about Jeff question mark emails, which we don't have to re-explain here. It's when Jeff asks you a question about a problem on the website or anywhere in Amazon. Uh, how did you cope with pressure and the responsibility? What would you say? Uh, how, do you, uh, how do you not burn out in 15 years <laughs> in the roles you've held uh well you know uh prayers one that's good you know and and uh that leads to a divine lot of help things. that's that's uh, a huge divine help up. is you know yeah thank you thank you lord jesus christ we're in good shape that does lead into thankfulness you know we talked about this ethan you know i'm a kid from you know western michigan who you know grew up picking onions on a farm like it's a privilege these are high class problems right? sure. the fact that i get to have this problem uh, is, is a problem of blessing, right? So I'm thankful, right? Uh, and, and maybe if I'm, if I'm not able to handle this for a long amount of time, like I'm in the wrong role, like maybe I do need to go replace myself and come back. Uh, so I think that's, that's something, it is something to consider. I've got, my wife and I have seven kids. Uh, so that's like practice, uh, you know, practice at home, what you do at work and you're like, Hey, uh, I've got a lot of work. So that means I need a lot of life to have good work-life balance. So you know, I can do the quick trick questions, but uh, it does help to keep perspective. Uh, so start with perspective, be thankful and, and figure this out. But you need to come back and be uh, uh, be practical. So one of the things that was practical to me, and, and I'm thankful for a couple of mentors, particularly Peter Percy at, at, at Amazon, is like, great, if you're spending your time on something, do you have a goal for it, right? Because there's lots of things you could be spending your time on. Matter of mm -hmm. fact, the more you look around, there's more things you could be spending your time on. So having alignment with what's expected of you, with your, uh, with your supervisor, with your boss, on these are the 10 things or these are the six things. I usually had about five to seven goal areas. Uh, these are the goals. These are results. I expect these goals. And I would do somewhat of a quarterly check. It's kind of effective executive. Drucker would be like, hey, you know, do you know where your time's going? Um, am I focused? And at what level of focus? You can't drive a revolution across six different goals right like this is my primary goal and i really want focus here having those conversations at a quarterly or basis and so if i found myself in a pressure situation i might go back and go hey has something crept in in my time have the goals changed do i need to go reset second thing uh i got from a different mentor whenever i was feeling stressed is i would open up the compensation tool at amazon and I would check my comp stress ratio. Uh, you know, is my team feeling uh, the similar level of stress to their comp? Because I, you know, hey, uh, you know, as a team, you know, it's not like I'm making this much more. You know, it's like, hey, you know, am I taking too much on? Sure. Right. We do that a lot. Right. So I'm like, maybe I need to offload a little stress, um, you know, because I've taken too much on. 
Um, but that's also an opportunity. It's a growth opportunity for you, right? Uh, actually, we, team, we talk about that results, a lot right? here, that, that yeah. uh, particularly with product managers, <clears throat> but with all sorts of people in high-performing workplaces, they're looking for opportunities to step up. One of the main yeah. messages, we'll, we'll test this on you. We'll see um, how often did members of any of your organizations come to you and proactively ask, how can I help you? Um, on my team, you know, I would say that was a regular question. Like, what can I take off your plate? Mm -hmm. Right. What can I take off your plate? Uh, you know, we, uh, and Kim you Rack would say you got Amazon. your team to where they were regularly asking you that. Yes. And that, that's, yes. that's the only way I've ever seen it to the, to the, whoever put in the question, how do you handle stress? Um, they're probably thinking from the idea that they're an individual contributor and don't have a team. So maybe you address what they do, but yeah, the only way I've ever seen a manager at Amazon have relatively lower stress is have a, a team behind them that is really picking things up and then delegating them down as well. But if you're an yeah. individual, try and, uh, maybe I'm an individual product manager. I feel responsible for this really big project how 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 do i manage that so priorities and goals would still be good knowing what my key That'd goals are yeah what else uh, I, I still want to talk there's a oh. couple other stress things on the manager side oh, so please. let me finish that up you know I, I would try to you know um you know at amazon as the business grows you know, it's like hey if the business is growing 27 percent a year are you growing 27 percent mm -hmm. a year are your abilities growing because guess what your job just got bigger while you sat there yep right um, you know, you just, you just got a promotion while you were sitting there, your scope of responsibility just increased. So I regularly look for how do I equip and prepare the people on my team to replace me? So, uh, you know, if you read the job descriptions, it's like, Hey, an L seven senior product manager should be able to communicate to a VP and SVP. So am I training my team to successfully be able to do that versus throwing them to the wolves? Right. Right. So did I give them an opportunity to practice writing, practice presenting? Hey, that's, that means OP one, right? Uh, how do I take myself out of the way? Uh, you know what? I'm going to schedule a vacation three weeks before OP one. That'll give me enough time to fix things if I need to, but I want to see how my team does, right? Mm. Uh, and then that means I can create capability. One of my jobs as a leader is to improve the capabilities for the company, including software capabilities, people capacity, and people capabilities, and as well as reduce costs, right? Uh, and deliver great things for customers. So helping people. To your individual question in terms of stress, um, I usually like rugby as a metaphor versus American football okay. because American football has large amount of specialization of roles. And so you kind of get in this like only this person can do this thing, whereas rugby is like, hey, there may be people better suited to a particular job task at the moment, but whoever is closest to it, uniquely positioned and sufficiently equipped uh, can do the job. And so, you know, this idea I don't want to think about of a hero product manager. At the end of the day, yes, the product manager is responsible, but they're still responsible for leading the team. They're a conductor. Uh, they're you know symphony conductor, a choir conductor. You know they're bringing a team of experts to deliver something or produce something. Uh, and so there's often an opportunity to either share the load or look uh, at the capacity uh, and make some changes. So that's the keywords that are really say. good. Uniquely positioned and sufficiently equipped. Someone, yes. because in many cases, the good enough person who can get there and do the work now is when, when time matters, and it usually does. Speed matters in business. Speed yeah. matters in business. That's bias fraction in, in the Amazon uh, uh, leadership principles. Um, that's huge. And, and we talk a lot about it, Amazon, and this may apply to how to manage stress. Don't let the great be the enemy of the good, because sometimes yeah. the right thing is, is this done and usable? Um, so, okay. Is it use, is, you know, think of a product release, like, Hey, we need, we don't need an MVP. I need something that solves a use case for one big customer set. And then we'll build on it. Right. Uh, one big customer. Yeah. But yeah, don't let the enemy be the perfect or the good. And so sometimes I would see product managers or someone's like, oh, we need translations. We're blocked on rolling this out because of translation. I'm like, well, besides the fact that 
we should have known we needed translations at the very beginning of the project. Um, do we know anybody that speaks German? Do we know anybody that speaks Hungarian? Uh, how can we crowdsource this? And then we'll, we'll make it better later. Do we know how good it needs to be? Uh, can we borrow, uh, you know, taking some of that stress out. And then also going back to that analytics piece is understanding the trade-offs and understanding the strategy. Is this a land rush? Do we need to be first to market? Are you feeling stressed because of self-imposed objectives and deadlines? Uh, self-imposed perhaps for the business. And do we understand the real impact of, of delay? Right. It's like if you delay a feature launch by two weeks, there's a business impact. Has anybody calculated it? You expected right. to get revenue or usage or whatever it was in that two weeks. And our regular will ask that question. And, uh, you know, you know, we, uh, it's like, oh yeah, didn't do the math on that yet. Like, sometimes the delay about, is critical and sometimes it's not. It'll All be right. okay. So another good question here. And I don't have a strong opinion on this. So I'd be curious your take. How has Amazon's definition and role of product manager changed over the course of the past five to 10 years? So hmm. during, during the arc of time you were at Amazon, how would you say product management, did it undergo any fundamental changes? I can probably think of one, but I'll hold it and see what you have in mind. Yeah. So I go back to the questions from what they, understanding oh, okay. things, understanding natural dates and natural deadlines. Mm -hmm. Right. Can can be a thing. Right. Amazon has natural dates of black in the consumer business for shopping, Black Friday, Prime Day. Um, and so understanding where you can absorb slips uh, and make things up uh, is a big deal. So do on Dubai can take stress off. And then you look for what extra can we deliver? Right. Maybe sometimes a delay turns into an opportunity. So how has the Amazon product manager role changed? Uh, the. One big change, I think, was, you know, as AWS developed internally, you know, the focus on, on tech uh, um, and how technical does a product manager need to be? Is a product manager really a business operator, um, business leader, or is a, is a product manager a, a technical builder? Right? Are they a builder in Amazon terms? Uh, are they building things out the door? I think there's been a, a fair amount of... Um, you know, I know it was a question that was, was getting a lot of scrutiny. Uh, and I think Amazon's a big enough place where you can probably have both archetypes. Uh, there's certainly people who operate as a product owner. You know, it could be detail page or something else, something that, that may be in less of a building mode. And there's a lot to be said about maybe you don't have any software engineering, but you're driving your product by um, doing customer marketing and adoption, focusing on, on product adoption instead of product releases. So uh product managers as builders versus product managers as as, uh, as business operators is one uh and i probably think of one other which you know i think of you know amazon is a big place has a lot more products across multiple life cycles and so how much are product managers just de facto we're giving you a team we're going to give you some people you know bring this thing from zero to 60 versus hey you're going to go you need to optimize we're giving you a product uh, that exists and and we want you to to optimize it and grow it a little bit i think that's the second one that i've seen uh, you know at, at amazon where there's been some refining and changes yeah so um my experience with that uh first i would echo you the technical level has deepened and in fact amazon over time has fragmented its internal definition of product manager into three categories there's not i won't say non-technical but there's product managers who aren't held to a strong technical bar um they're and they are simply called pms there's pmts where the t means technical and then there's a new designation um for service product managers that are basically the mm -hmm. aws ones that are expected to really be very technical and so we do have a question later in the queue which i may skip over when we get there of how important are technical skills and it depends tremendously on what you're designing because we're talking a lot about amazon product management there are product managers i would assume i would guess who work for cruise lines and and uh define you know the the room and the welcome experience and and the buffet experience and all kinds of things 
and these are products and how do we sell you know the second floor suites and the third floor suites which are different and what should they have in them and that's a non-technical product manager where technical skills are going to matter very very little when you contrast that to someone working for uh aws or someone working for say tesla um but at Amazon, the role has definitely changed to have more technical differentiation. The other one I would say has changed is scale. Um, I know back when yeah. you started, there would have been a lot, of, because it was the same when I started, we started at the same time, there was a lot of emphasis on the two pizza team. The idea that no team should be bigger than can be fed by two pizzas, and that team often looked like a half dozen engineers an engineering leader and a product manager was kind of the default set of people at the table for the pizza. And now you have products that are big and sprawling. And while you can try and subdivide them in the end, some product like Kindle devices or Alexa devices or EC2 is going to have dozens of product managers on different pieces of it. So that's the other way. Um, at Amazon today and at many larger companies, you could ask, are you the lone product manager working on some brand new idea or are you one of three dozen working on some huge successful idea? I don't know if you want to riff on any of that or we, if you feel that's good, we well, can when I, move on either way. Yeah, it's, it's, worth, it's worth doing because I think you know, as people look for product manager jobs, right, or, or they uh, – uh, as they're thinking about what's at Amazon or not, I would get the mentor question like, Hey, I'm thinking about a role. I've currently got this role. And I would ask some two by two matrix questions, right? Try to like, just ask two questions, see if I can help put them in a quadrant, right? So, you know, how much responsibility for the entire product do you want? And what stage of the product life cycle do you want to be in? Because if somebody wanted to be in a mid stage or late stage part of the product life cycle, uh, and they wanted full ownership, well, that's going to put you in a, probably a pretty small pro product if you don't have experience. Or if you're willing to try an early stage and there's going to be a lot of invention, uh, you probably could still get ownership of the whole thing. Uh, so that was, you know, Amazon had a lot of space. There's a lot of different kinds of product managers. Uh, and then I would also ask, you know, how much invention do you want? And really on technology, it was usually technology invention. Uh, and how much do you want to really kind of invent a new thing uh, versus how much do you want to really drive a lot of value? Uh, because again, similar to early life cycle or not, uh, there's going to be less options. If you want to be more startup early life cycle, invent something new, there's places for that at Amazon. Probably wasn't detail page a lot of times, right? I was doing a lot of evolution, a few products, um, unless you were me. Um, and even I'm not sure I had responsibility the whole time. Every category leader thought they owned the detail page, uh, which is good. I like fighting for ownership. Uh, we should all be going after the ball, moving it forward. But, uh, you know, that's a that's a big thing to give somebody whole ownership of. So, yeah, I would see that mentorship a lot. And as you look, it's a great way to think of if you want to improve in the craft, can I own a service? Can I own a small feature? Can I own, you know, I'm working with a client now that, you know, they're, they're building product managers and some of the product managers have, two, three years experience, uh, it's like, well, hey, let's walk through who uses your product. What do they get out of it? Where is it broken? Uh, and they've been given a small piece of the company's total software, but they've been able to follow some good product management craft and be able to make a growth path for it and step up to responsibility and it gets noticed. So it's, it's a, a way to think about you can choose how to make your own product management craft adventure, if you will. Okay. So this is probably my favorite audience question because you said to me privately earlier and also said to me here or said to everyone uh -oh. here um, that you haven't always had success hiring MBAs. So we have a number of MBAs in the audience, not surprisingly, some of who are product <laughs> managers, product management interns, et cetera. They're super curious since MBAs haven't worked out for you, how do MBAs become more useful? Because these are highly motivated, you know, energetic, uh, early career professionals. They want to be successful. Let's say I have an MBA from one of the, you know, many, but, you know, top 20, top 30, very good schools. What else do I do to become part of Stefan's team of supermen? 
What 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 do I add to my MBA or what do I change or what's the gap you've seen in MBAs? Yeah. You know, one, one, you, you tend to kind of develop signals, right? You see a lot of patterns of your own internal machine mm -hmm. learning thing, right? You mentioned earlier, like, I don't want walls of text. You know, I saw lots of Amazon feature proposals in the, the Amazon press release format. I, for me, I was like, if it's longer than, you know, there should be a paragraph of white space at the bottom. The best ones always have a paragraph of white space at the bottom because they don't need the whole page uh, to say something well. And, you know, I could see that. Uh, and for product manager profiles, one profile I saw was often successful that may answer this question and that I had some great success with was the engineer who'd went back and got an MBA uh, mm -hmm. in their internship. They did something they were uncomfortable with, right? They, uh, they went to investment banking or uh, they did something that was probably not closely connected with the kind of engineering that they had done with in the past. So that when they got uh, to Amazon, they also realized they were still learning. They didn't feel they had nailed it down. But across that strategy analytics execution uh, and domain skill, I'll add that in there, they knew how things were built, right? They knew the process of building software uh, on the execution side. They could help identify trade offs uh, in more ways than one. Uh, so their MBA had now given them the, you know, different financial ways to think about making trade offs versus architectural costs or architectural. Uh, trade-offs. Uh, and then, you know, from a strategy perspective, they kept learning, they kept asking, right? And they, they didn't think that just the degree got them done. We all acquire skills a lot of different ways. Um, shh, don't tell anybody, I don't have an MBA or an engineering degree. Uh, so, you know, I guess my engineering degree is my time at Amazon. I have one from Amazon. I uh, made my MBAs from there too. Uh, but, um, you know, you we acquire skills different ways. And so as you think about an MBA, a lot of, you know, there's not an entitlement. It's come in and show your stuff. Uh, the engineers often had a background that understood how things were built or how things got built. I would say some of the mistakes I made in hiring were putting uh, one of two things, matching the person's skill acquisition path. They had gone to say, again, I'll use my example, say Chicago, deep economics piece, and I put them on a software platform product management role, right? That's like putting them in a hole, right? They had a lot to learn. They were doing a domain area for the first time um, and they had to learn that, right? Uh, and so it was, was giving them more holes um, or taking someone, you know, so that was, you know, a, probably a bad match and it was going to take them longer to be successful. It's time maybe they didn't have or passion they didn't have, right? Like I don't want to work in, logistic space. I don't want to invent a new shipping program for Amazon sellers. I'd really like to work on mobile app technology. It's like, I'd work to launch a mobile app. Okay. Can we combine those things? Launch a shipping mobile app. So I would say matching of, of people's backgrounds to the role they hired into was a mistake that I made. Um, I probably should have even just pushed back and say, you know what? I'd rather help that person find a better fit role at Amazon than fill out my team. Uh, and then the second mistake I made was I'm, I focused too much on a role and not on the team. So you know, before you go on to that, to, because I, yeah. you've talked about that for a minute, I just want to be clear. So in that case where someone wanted to build a mobile app and you solved it by trying to match them to something, you think you'd have been in hindsight, you wish you'd have pointed them in a better direction for them and kept looking. Did I hear that yes. correctly? Okay. Absolutely. And, I would yeah. generally agree with that. It's good managers try to support what their team wants to do, including candidates, but not to the point where it compromises the team. What that does mean is you have to be willing to sometimes let go of high performers because their interests are taking them in a, in a direction the team no longer needs. And that's tough to do yep. as well when you're always short people. Uh, you know, it is, but you start to get a cycle of payback over time. So, you know, I, I regularly would tell the people that, you know, I had on my team for whom I had the privilege of serving as their leader. Look, I want to help you meet your career goals, hopefully at Amazon, hopefully working with me on our team. But in if that not, order. yep. And oh. if not, you know, let's help you. And so if maybe it's not at Amazon because Amazon doesn't have it. Now, Amazon has a lot of stuff. So maybe I need to help you get to Twitch or help you get to drones or whatever yeah. you could qualify for. Uh, 
because two years down the road, three years down the road, if they're happy and successful and they've stayed at Amazon, guess what? It might be time for us to work together. And even if it's not, they might refer the next yep. person and say, that's a guy that's going to help in your career. Great. Completely. Uh, if uh, I can help them. Fantastic. Which right? for and everybody I watching, people like that. That's why you know, Stefan immediately offered to come on the show as we, we share a passion for helping people grow in their careers. Um, yeah. Because it does, it's not a completely selfless passion. You end up with this world of people that are happy and positive and think well of your leadership and send you new great folks. And so, you know, uh, Amazon, in fact, has a value that, that said that leaders develop talent not just for themselves, but for the rest of the organization. Being a source of talent was considered a point of pride, um, and justly so. Okay, cool. So yeah. I interrupted you. Or I asked you to rewind. You yeah. you had said that um, one of your mistakes was fitting people, you know, working too hard to try and make a project that fit them. And then you were going on to another point. Um, well, the second point I was making was, uh, you know, I've also a bad fit to the role, but also bad fit to the team. Mm. Right. So if I have three to five product managers and we're the we're the seller growth team or I have three to five product managers and we're the Amazon detail page team, uh, you know, if you're building a pitching staff on a baseball team, you don't need and you have five people. You don't need five right hand fastball pitchers. Right. right? So, you know, if I uh, I want to look across my team and go, do I have a good effective mix? And there's lots of mix choices. It's not like it's a magic recipe of one kind of mix, but you also know when you're out of balance. So do I have a mix of brand new people to Amazon uh, and tenured people on Amazon? People who have been here a long time and know how to navigate unofficial channels to get things done and people who are bringing new ideas and covering blind spots. Do I have a good diverse mix of you know, kind of life experience in, in different regions, right, to reflect our customer base. And so if I'm going to bring someone on who's who's going to imbalance that, or, or maybe they're too junior for the product or the project, right? Uh, no, we really do need to deliver a multi-billion dollar project for the Amazon detail page. I'm glad you're a new product manager. You're really awesome. It's the first time I've ever done this. would be high risk for me and unfair to our overall team uh, so I, I would also look for the mix to the team um, as as a mistake i've made where i've just had too many people that were like me or too many people that had the same core skill set and what i should have done was because um, also at amazon you have enough flex in your roadmap as a leader uh, often to be able to change the role a little bit or redistribute ownership across that product management team so, you know, I made a mistake where I brought someone on and I couldn't give them enough responsibility fast enough. They were actually pretty senior uh, and I just couldn't give them enough room to grow. Uh, and so it ended up being a bad fit in a short, uh, short time span uh, uh, before we end up helping them rotate to another team. It, it didn't help the overall product set of the group we, we, we managed. So it slowed some other people down in their career. Interestingly, the very next question really weighs on this as well, which is how do you keep strong product managers from leaving your team? So you and I have just talked about when is it the right thing? Um, when it is, when is it the right time to encourage that? Uh, but given that it's so highly sought after, um, you know, I think we'd both say, obviously, investing in people's careers, but talk a little bit about what you did to keep your great talent appropriately, given that you had these boundaries of when to help them move on. I'm sure you probably also lost people you'd have preferred to have kept. How did you think about that a little bit? Yeah. So I was in most of my roles for, for three to six years. Uh, and Long so time. Long time. And so my product team would turn over a little bit, a lot mm -hmm. like sports teams. There yeah. is a season at Amazon, right? There's an annual season of I'm going to build next year's business plan. I'm going to craft it. So one thing I would do is, you know, first things I'm like, look, when I bring somebody onto the team, usually from some type internal transfer or extra, I'm like, you know, I would like you to stay on our team. Amazon's a great place to learn and work for your career. I'd like to stay on our team for as long as it takes for you to make a great contribution that you'd add to your LinkedIn profile build up your trade credit. Uh, and usually for most people, you know, at a, a mid-level, that's going to be at least a year. Uh, and ideally, so let's check in. 
right? Let's do that. And then the second thing I'd do is, so you've been here the first year, probably got a goal assigned to you or a product assigned to you that uh, somebody else had determined, right? Uh, and now we're going to come to the annual cycle. And great. Here's an opportunity to craft. How do you want to craft the big challenge for yourself next year, right? Build something that's interesting for you. And let's see if we can work that in. I would regularly look around. I would tell my directs as well. I look around Amazon and outside Amazon about once a year. And if I see something that's interesting to me, uh, I check myself and go, why is that interesting? And I bring it back to my boss to, if I need to and say, you know, I'd like to add a little more machine learning to my job because uh, that's interesting and I want to learn it. And I think it could be useful to bring benefit. And sure enough, usually <laughs> I would get a, yes, great, please do that. Uh, and I didn't need to change my job, but I still got to work on something new that I got to learn uh, or I got exposed to a different team. And I would encourage my directs to do that. Say, let's make this the job that you want it to be. And you're going to be here and we're going to work together for a good two, three years uh, on that pattern. Who would you like to learn from? Uh, so I usually look at three things that kept people attached to a job. Are they connected to the leader? They like the team mix and they like the leader mix because they're learning or they like that style of work. Are they connected to the domain area? Uh, they really like e-commerce, they really like retail. Or are they connected to a challenge? They want price competitiveness and they really wanna drive and become an expert in, in e-commerce pricing. And if I could find the, you know, what's connecting you to our team for this year uh, and then see if I could, you know, uh, kind of almost re-sign them, right? It's like a military, you know, re-up, right? Yeah. Do you wanna re-up for this project? Uh, does it hit your motivator to stay with us? Um, and, and but then I'd go back, you know, you know how do I help you meet your career goals? Yeah. And uh, in Stefan, you're hearing for everyone watching someone who's living the leader side of what I commonly call the magic loop. Um, I've developed this thing. I think I may have sh shared it with you before, but the idea yeah. of how people can pursue their careers. And part of that is what you talked about earlier, which is asking your boss how you can help. But part of that is also then framing those questions over time as you earn trust and perform. I'd love to help you, uh, but is there a way I could incorporate machine learning in that, to your example, right? Is there a way, does our team have a need in this interest, this area of interest so that I'm both aligned with the team's needs and my own? And so you talked about the individual who you've gone, you've been over, too far over backwards trying to meet their needs. But at the same time, often that's quite possible. You can go too far to where you're compromising what the team really needs to get done to try and keep someone who's interested in whatever, butterflies or you know, um, uh, trade relations. The latest methodology in, in product management, yeah. Yeah, but often, what they're after, particularly if they have more than one interest, which most top performers have many interests, you can find something that like, yes, we do need that. And sure, you can lead it. Um, yeah. And so uh, I posted the magic loop short link in chat, oh, cool. just, just because, um, or the short summary, just because it turns out in talking to you, you're hitting on every point in it, which is a great, um, well, it's, it's great for people it's a validation. to see. It's, it's, it's validation. It's a successful thing. It's, if it's uh, true, you're going to see it pop up. I would add one more thing that I did a couple times, sure. especially for my top performers. Oh, good. I would ask, who are they learning from, right? Had they thought who they're, they're actually learning from? And then I would also add, um, I would add, uh, you know, for, especially for my top performers, like they, I would see if I'd be interested in a challenge. You know, I've got something I think I'd like you to do. Uh, can I make it a two way door for you? I'd like we I need a leader to really take on this thing. It's got a big growth potential. It's a little higher risk assignment because uh, you might fail at it. Uh, it's something you haven't done before, but I think you're capable. Uh, and especially having that, you know, uh, that play where sometimes I'd give a sponsorship, right? Like, no, I really do think you're capable. Uh, mm. And I know you haven't done it before, but let's give it a try. And I'm going to play along with you. Right. And if we look like you're in trouble and be your safety net, we'll figure it out. But, uh, you know, setting that you know, up as well, I think, was a, another thing that kept great talent because they, they got to learn um, for people that that was a passion for. Uh, they got the chance to do it. Okay. So I know, uh, you know, you, you offered to uh, come on the show and spend around 90 minutes. We're getting close to that. I want to be respectful of your time. I'm going to skip over a question because uh, it'll make a great end of show question. 
There's oh, one more I'd really like to get to here. It's a little bit long, but it is common. So we've been talking about Amazon, which is a really high performing overall. People can love Amazon yeah. or hate it, but overall it's a high performing workplace. This person learn says, a lot there. I work in a large bank and product decisions slash priorities um, are, are disconnected from the product teams. They're being decided by management who are disconnected. What advice do you have for people looking to drive improvements in this form of bottom up? So uh, what do I do if I don't work at such a wonderful, highly actualized place as Amazon? And I'm sure in your current consulting business, you've, you've run into a variety of companies, so you may have some advice. What do I do if I'm not in you know, fairy tale land for great product managers on yeah. my team? You know, one of the, uh, it's a great question. And, and I think it's true. Even if you are at Amazon, but you're far, you know, a lot of those guy want to be a product manager. You know, can I be a product manager when I grow up or that sounds like a great role. And I think some of it is I get to be the one in charge of what we do. Right. Yeah. You know, I get to say, this is what gets done. So take the product manager part out of the title and go, how should we decide what gets done? Right. And if your company is still has some level of customer focus, right? Or some, some level of optimization. Uh, what I've found some clients is there's a lot of places that don't have a very deep knowledge of what their customers do or what their customers want. So can you start being a customer expert, right? Can you start either finding some data? What, you know, I sat down with a billion dollar company. They have a, 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 a business portal for uh, tens of thousands of customers. Great. What, where are your customers spending the most amount of their time? Well, we're actually not instrumented. We grew really fast, right? Okay. Well, let's get instrumented, right? Cause we can probably find out, we can probably learn something and then propose a fact-based, uh, product idea, right? Or at least understand, is this a good decision? So can I build some expertise as a customer expert? Whether you're the product leader or not, your management will probably appreciate that. Uh, you may not have access to the data. You may not get permission to get access to data. And that may take some negotiation or see, hey, I'd like to try this. So you may need to slice it. Can I be the product? You know, I mentioned noise to signal filtering earlier. Um, dealing with customer service teams is great. Great. It's a rich source of uh, it's a rich source of customer anecdotes because every interaction is a customer anecdote. But I often found it difficult, maybe like fracking, because um, it had so many anecdotes and you had to distill that back to a signal. And each little anecdote was kind of so punchy by itself. Uh, but that's another place like how can you help become a customer expert? Can you find some of those customer signals? That's the first part. Don't worry about the product manager title take it apart a little bit and go, am I learning and curious uh, about product management? And then another way to, to look at it a little bit is to the degree you can get permission or exposure at the company to understand what do we expect this to do? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a great old book. I love first principle books. Guy uh, wrote a book called Technopoly. You know, and it reminds yourself that products have first principles. Like what problem is that trying to solve? Why do I need power door right the old door lock worked just fine right what's the problem that that feature is trying to solve people off, you mentioned earlier like people have oh i want to build this great if you build that what metrics will change about my business right, right. Uh, there's another twist question i'll do a lot of times and those people come with the idea isn't this so cool won't it be great great if we do that who will care and what metrics will change about my business well you can do that as an amateur product manager uh, if you're in a bank or wherever, like, help me understand, like, why is this important to our strategy? What do we expect to happen, at least at a high level, if you can't get all the way to the business metrics, uh, from this product decision? Because, um, yeah, you know, sometimes there are times where it's just like, nope, that's what I want. Uh, I want the button to be green. Okay, well, there's a golden rule factor. He who has the gold makes the rule. Yeah, uh, sure. But, some, uh, some, yeah. You know, but uh, there's often, you know, a lot of times, sometimes you need to set up I'll give a different example. Uh, you know, who decides what goes on the Amazon homepage, right? Well, Jeff gets to decide that that's going to be Kindle. Great. We're going to have a lot of Kindle. But if I can give my leadership a trade-off mechanism for all the other things we can put on the homepage. So instead of trying to contend, I want this, you want that, I can give a set of dials and say, 
here's a system for deciding what's going to be placed in the content of this page, or here's a system for making trade-offs in your product. Uh, you know, that's a great product manager skill to give those prioritization frameworks and be able to show connections and data to the business or customer impact. So that's kind of my short answer question. It's a hard question. It's probably kind of prescriptive. I don't know. I'd be excellent at it, but find the pieces you can take apart that you can succeed in and create more visibility for the company. Well, you've, the you customers. gave me unintentional affirmation by, um, uh, tripping over the things I preach in this magic loop, I will return the favor by saying I was typing in chat while you started talking about uh, what it would take, uh, how I would handle being in a, in a company. And anyway, my answers were data and customer anecdotes or customer, which were two of the first things you said. The only other thing I said, which because there are a lot of engineers who want to get things done, is working demo. If you can have a yeah. hack or a prototype. Three, three ways me. to get things done. Data, clearly, if you have, if you have data, uh, if you have customer expertise, which you said, um, and then, you know, nothing will get attention so much as look at what we already <laughs> built. We just need to, you know. So that was how I ran my year at Amazon. I would try to build for some small customer set as fast as I could January through April so that I had some data to say, if we scaled this, this is how much it'd be. Like I didn't build a business case. You know, we'd try to actually run a web lab experiment where we showed something to some set of customers. It was always much more powerful uh, to, to do the show. Uh, show part of it, super fun. All right. So in respect for your time, uh, the last question that got a lot of votes and is very popular, I think would be a great one to wrap up on. And it's clearly one you've thought about. And that question is, uh, what is your favorite book? Um, and so I know you mentioned you had a lot of them. Feel free to list more than one, but we will start with one. If you were going to guide people, hey, to make your career better or your career maybe in product management, what's the golden book if there is one? Uh, there is. And any of, if any of my former employees are, are watching this, they're just laughing right now. Uh, okay. because they know what book I'm going to go to. Uh, you know, I go through a set because I want my product managers to have skill in making resource trade-offs and whatever. So I have some history books and war books because those are a lot about resource trade-offs and hard decisions, decision criteria. So Winston Churchill's War Leadership is a great little book by Churchill's uh, you know, uh, official historian, The Effective Executive, uh, the goal I already mentioned. But my go-to book, uh, you know, is Managing Management Time by William Onken. Uh, and it's an old book. You probably have to buy it and uh, buy it used. Uh, but, and, and it's a classic. Uh, uh, it's been, there's excerpts out of it, Harvard Business Cases. There's actually a one-minute manager meets the monkey, a one-minute manager book of this book. But we use concepts out of this book uh, across my team on so much of a basis. His premise is management time is the thing you were hired for. It's, it's your creative thing that you bring to the role. But there are four other kinds of time that tend to squeeze out your ability to, to do that uh, creative management time. You have uh, company time or stakeholder time where they're pushing down on you. You have to deliver X. You, know, you have to deliver X. Um, we need an NPI process or whatever company mandates. You have subordinates and people and mentees reporting to you um, and you need to give them one-on-ones. You need to help their career development. That's taking time. Uh, and, and then you have customers and suppliers. Um, suppliers may be partner dependency teams. But we would use this book a ton to start finding ways to, uh, across our team, go, are we spending our time on our, how do we get more as a team of this management time? Uh, and how do we know we're spending time with our customers in each group? Uh, that is going to free us up instead of pressure us. Uh, so a lot of fun lessons that book, but managing management time is my go-to. I still read it about once a year. It starts, the opening chapter really hits on process without purpose. Uh, and he talks about his first job. And uh, it's one of the few books that as you, uh, as you read, you know, you can go read the hard business case or you can go read an excerpt. You can read the cliff notes online, but his stories are fun. And I, uh, find it when it's like I get more out of every chapter. Nice. It's not a one-trick pony. 
All right. And then the other one, uh, just because I love Winston Churchill, was War Leadership. Is that right? Uh, Winston Churchill's War Leadership by Sir Martin Gilbert. Okay. And then I recently read another history book that I've added. It's the first book I've added to my list in uh, in, in about three or four years. Because um, each book fulfills a particular class, if I was making this my own portable MBA class. But I added a book called Colonel Boyd. It's an auto- autobiography of Colonel Boyd. Uh, Colonel John Boyd uh, wrote uh, the training manual for fighter pilots uh, and going to, uh, coming out of after he'd been one in the Korean War. And so he, he wrote the training manual for that. He also was significant behind the design of uh, fighter jets, the Air Force and Navy, and then was part of the architect plan of how Marines uh, go to battle and do uh, their battle plans, in particular the Gulf War. Uh, and here's a lot of stories in there of how he also navigated all the complexities of large bureaucracy to get stuff done. Uh, so lots of lessons to learn. You know, not I necessarily think I've, I think you know, I've the greatest heard of character, this. but this book recently the colonel boyd book yeah so he'll talk a lot about an ooda loop um is is a big takeaway from that book but the uh also just navigating navigating large bureaucratic organizations uh, was a another fun takeaway out of that book interesting all right i do a lot of work uh, with uh, information dashboard design which i mentioned earlier from stephen few especially the first edition uh, so it's a quick way to win with numbers and number presentation, but good design principles across the board. And that's the other one. That's probably the second one. And then for those who write, because I, I drank Amazon's Kool-Aid on writing, I'm all in writing is thinking. Uh, you know, there's a number of good books out there. I tend to work with my product managers on the, the Barbara Minto Pyramid Principle. Um, and it was it's a tough book, but uh, the, the lesson part is super helpful. It's a fairly esoteric uh... I, I will say a, a fairly esoteric reading list. Um, yeah, these are I'll not. Show you my list. Are... I have it. I have it as a public wish list on Amazon. I occasionally put it in there. Yeah, I tend to go after history and classics, uh, where we can get the first principles. So yeah, it's, nice. It's a little different than the average the average business book list, I think. So, Stefan, anything you want to say about product management or, or to an audience of interested young professionals, uh, not all young, uh, interested, eager <laughs> professionals? Some of them are young. We have a lot of Twitch skews demographically uh, younger. But um, anything you feel you should yeah. add that we haven't covered? Last words of wisdom? <laughs> You know, we've covered a lot of ground from from hiring to, you know, breaking apart. Like, how do we get started? You know, the customer, the anecdotes, prototype. I think it's a great time to be, um, you know, I don't focus on the product title. You know, it's in my LinkedIn thing. I love delighting customers, you know, building technical solutions or technology-based solutions to delight customers and, and create process efficiencies. I think it's a great time to, to pursue that craft and and keep refining what the craft of product management is. So. Uh, just try something. Go go find some customers, measure, talk to them, delight them. It was a regular thing in my my team meeting. Everybody knew it could be a pop quiz. He's like, tell me about your favorite customer. And I expected them to tell me a story about their name, why they started selling on Amazon, what their strategy was, what they thought their pain points were. Because I wanted to inculcate that behavior of regularly talk to the mm. people uh, who are using, we build stuff for people not just customers or users, we build stuff for people. So go enjoy the stories that people have using your product and become a great storyteller. That's fantastic advice. It mirrors um, advice from the Twitch founder. Since we're on Twitch, I'll share this with you. You wouldn't know, but he talked about how in his first six startups, um, he rolled his eyes up in his head and thought up ideas that he thought someone might want and then started building them. And we see this so often. He didn't talk to anyone. No, no real customers. So, um, so anyway, well, I will let you go. I appreciate your time very, Thank very much. You. It's been Pleasure. fun. I look forward to seeing what uh, you keep evolving. Um, you know, I now see your LinkedIn posts and see the things you're doing. Uh, you have a special base of highly valuable knowledge in terms of helping connect, you know, streamline the process where people can take their interest and end up expressing it as a purchase. That's like a, 
that's an infinite well of value. So it's fun to shop and it's great to help people have fun. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, I'll go ahead and drop you off the Zoom call. I'll wrap up here with my audience, but thank you again. And, right. and my thanks to your friend Darren for hosting you as well. Cheers. Cheers.